we can put book club dash execution. I think uh, the discipline of getting things done, I think that would be the way to approach it. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know that we need to put peer executive groups in the title, um, but certainly um, it leaves people open to find the book, watch our video and so forth, so on. So real quick here, um, my name is Dan Crowley and with peer executive groups, and I'm going to just quickly share with you a synopsis of the first half of the book. Um, so Discipline and Getting Things Done, awesome book. I actually read it and finished it. Very happy to s suggest. So um, Larry Bossidy and Ram Sharan are the um, authors. Uh, Larry uh, calls upon his experience at GE as well as Allied Signal. Um, certainly, you know, Wikipedia, both of them, you'll find out. Uh, a little bit about them and their history and what they've been able to do. Um, what we did was in the first half was we talked about why execution is needed and also uh, started to discuss the building blocks of execution. And um, from there, then we went into um, uh, how the three building blocks work together. So that's where we're going to pick up. I'm just going to move down through these slides. And certainly uh, you can go to our previous video to hear more about these pieces. So we wanted this meeting to be about the three core processes that are identified in the second half of the book. So the people process, the strategy process, and the operations process. Um, we have a tendency inside peer groups to really uh, expect the owners of their businesses to be um, focused on vision and strategy and we don't necessarily make it a priority to say hey you need to be on top of the people process and the operations process but this book makes a case for that triangle uh, to be the main focus of any person who is sitting on top of the the business and how they're going to be able to be successful and push things forward so first thing we're going to tackle is the people process and in this section um, we focus on three blocks. One is linking people to the other two um, strategy and ops. And then uh, the second block, we're going to talk about continuous improvement, succession depth, and reducing retention risk. Uh, a couple of tools there that they share in the book, which I always enjoy when you can pull some something out and use it in your company. And then uh, block three is really like, how do I deal with non-performers? We could have used this in our last meeting an hour ago, Charlie, because we were talking about, you know, communicating to the next tier and being able to, um, you know, have them meet our expectations, right? So um, block four then gets into linking HR to business results. Um, and then there is a nice little short story in the book about live ammo and what that is. And technically it's right there. It says candid dialogue is live ammo. So building block number one, linking ops and strategy. So um, in this section of the book, um, you know, the, the summary had all the goodies in it. So I was very happy to see that because I'm a big picture person. I want the highlights up front and then give me the detail behind the highlights. So um, in the very first couple of pages, they quickly identify that people is the most important of these three. Um, and that's different than a lot of books would lead you to believe things like traction, um, where it all comes down to VTO and vision and things like that uh, as a as the key piece. Um, so the reason why they say people is most important is it ev evaluates individuals accurately and in depth um, if you have your people uh, system in place. Um, also, it provides a framework for identifying and developing the leadership talent. And lastly, if you have good people systems, you'll be able to fill your leadership pipeline. Um, and that is ultimately the basis for strong succession. And we'll talk about your one year, three year, five year, and how it relates to um, looking at your people a little differently than what we've suggested in the past. So must be forward looking. There are three terms. There's the near term, which goes for up to the first two years. Medium term is uh, two to five years, and then long term is longer than five years. So again, 
do you have people that can carry you to those next terms? And if not, what needs to happen in terms of development to get them to that level? Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Good, good. So the second building block in the book, um, in the people section of the book, talks about developing the leadership pipeline. And um, this is interesting. They lean on these three items as part of how to do that. So number one is, do you have continuous improvement in mind? Is it part of the fabric of your company? Um, you know, when you look at your company, you know, we were on the phone just re this past hour, somebody had 60 employees. Do you have depth uh, in that group that uh, is leadership depth or can be you know, expected to grow into leadership. Um, and then lastly, um, if you've developed your leadership pipeline, you will have uh, reduced retention risk, um, which we'll go into in detail what that might look like here for you. So a couple tools pop up right when they get into that. And first one has to do with um, assessing leadership. So I thought this was cool. Um, you could take your staff and run them through this and say, hey, is um, on a performance note, are they above or below uh, expectations uh, in terms of performance or what, what needs to happen in that role? Um, and then secondly, do, do they exhibit the behavior necessary to be good in that job um, above or below? Where where do you see them landing? Um, and you can kind of qualify them with any of these labels, right? So um, you might think of an employee and say, well, this employee has high potential. All right, well, where would they land right now on the grid? Um, are they, you know, is there a person that's promotable? Is there a person with experience? Um, is someone in your organization too new and that makes them be, um, you know, are they, uh, performing or does the behavior match but again if you think about these on the right hand side they don't really have to do with performance and behavior they have to do with the quality of that person um and your relationship with them and how how it's been over the last period that you're sitting with them do they need any of these things and you mark them onto this leadership assessment grid um needs job change obviously is an x you know find find out uh probably below their behavior level than where they need to be and also below the performance level for that particular individual. So interesting tool. Uh, I may try using it, see how see what comes of it. The other tool that they had in this section of the book, which I thought was worth looking at, was almost like a skills assessment. Do they have the ability to uh, do continuous improvement? Do they think the way you would want them to think to do it. So, you know, which box excellent at standard or below standard when you look at their business acumen, customer focus, strategic insights, vision, purpose, vision and purpose, values and ethics, um, action, do they take action, um, commitment to the company, teamwork, innovation, staffing skills, um, developing people, training and development, and then lastly, performance. So the idea being that I can look at one person versus another and be able to gauge, um, you know, who's best for what role as it relates to looking at growing the business or ha having us meet a strategic um, goal. So, Retention risk is the next piece that they address in this second part, uh, second building block. And um, there they want you to assess what is the, the employee's marketability outside of the company. Um, and also look at their potential for mobility. So they may have marketability, but they may not have potential mobility to leave you and go across the country for another job. Um, so that really, all those things factor into risk of them leaving. And so you wanna look at you know, what's in place. 
I stopped short of creating a grid for this. I think that's a little overkill, but you get it. You get the idea that you could create a grid for this. Sure. Right. Yeah. Um, next piece is, you know, short term recognition. If these people are leading your company, they're doing good things. And so how is the company recognizing them short term? Um, you know, I send a pizza to Charlie every other week on a Friday. <laughs> You must Just have kidding. my address wrong. <laughs> <laughs> One of my neighbors is getting a pizza now. Like, oh, this is kind of nice. <laughs> I just found your address today, by the way. <laughs> Two years in the company. Still still don't have Lauren's address figured out, but uh, I'm all about short-term recognition. Um, and then I would say long-term wealth, right? So if somebody is... Make sure you have the address right when you get to that one, would you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That one counts more. Okay. And then also conversations about career paths, right? So um, if you're not doing those three things, you're probably at you know contributing to a retention risk issue. So again, these are all people-related this is um, a critical element of the leader of the company to to be tied into the people side. Um, next one is building block three, dealing with non-performers. And this was kind of weird. It was a kind of a weak section of the book. Um, I feel like you could write a book about this, but the content they had inside this book was limited. Um, you know, I, I think, at the end of the day, there's probably four pages. And if you read it properly, it was kind of like, okay, non-performers. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Fire them. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but no, it, it has to do with um, training and development, um, seeing forward progress, understanding when to cut ties. Um, you know, we talk about uh, slow to hire, quick to fire. Um so really, uh, the policies of your company should be very clear to non-performers. I know that, you know, we have some co some members in peer groups who have regular quarterly conversations around the values and the matching up of values with the employee. And if the employee is not um, meeting the goals of the values of the company, they actually get put on a um, kind of a little bit of a suspension or they get put in a um, like a warranty period uh, before they potentially get fired for not matching uh, the values of the company. So uh, that's dealing with it, right? That's creating a um, result and expectation uh, for them. Fourth building block on the people process is linking HR to business results. And so this really has to do, I look at it, and again, I'm translating a lot of the book, which was written in 2002, to um, Traction, which was written in, in what, 2010 or something like that. So um, linking HR to business results, to me, has to do with uh, performance metrics. So you would be reading that section and say, okay, um, you know, there's going to be communication and conversation around your role in the company, but ultimately there's an expectation for everybody's role to hit a metric goal or to even have metrics attached to their, uh, to their role in the company. So that's really what they're talking about there in that section. And then I think they end that whole people process by talking about uh, live ammo and essentially saying that the live one guy quoted said candid dialogue in our company is the live ammo that we need to adjust um, the people process in in the face of strategy right so in in the in to make execution go smooth so candid dialogue uh how do you do it when do you do it a lot of it um there are books written about it you know how do you um, have the kind of conversations with your staff um, we're going to talk a, in a minute here about how the word how and 
uh, having a regular communication about how you expect something to be done or communicated to them or they're working on that how. Um, but a lot of that is part of the process, um, not just the here's our target, go forth and conquer, but making sure that there is conversation both ways. Um, they had a couple examples in the book about walking away from a meeting and having that quick, candid dialogue as they're exiting a meeting space. So I thought that was interesting. So next piece is the strategy process. In this section, I, I kind of grabbed some of the high points and put them in here. Um, again, the, the point of this book really is linking strategy people and operations to get you to the best execution you can, right? It's the book's called Execution. So in this section, we talk about the importance of hows. And uh, we had a tendency here in peer groups the last year or two to not really focus on the house. We're really focused on uh, setting expectations and walking away. Um, and the house pull the owner operator back into the discussion to say, OK, I have to sign off on the how. So let's let's figure out how we're going to get there. And we'll talk about some of these will look familiar for anybody who's in traction or EOS um, to hold people accountable and, and make sure that there's clear communication about uh, setting a specific uh, goal. So the building blocks of a strategy um, are addressed. We're going to look at who builds the plan, uh, building the strategic plan. Any guesses there, Charlie? Are you still on here? I can't see anybody. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. Do you uh, any I guesses as to who My guess builds? Would be, it would be the implementer, right? That's right. Actually, it, it would be the employees, right? Mm -hmm. So the ones yeah. who are implementing are the ones who would build the strategic plan. You're correct. So very, very good. Um, I would also say that um, uh, the next piece is what questions you should ask for a strategic plan, right? This is really good. I thought this was one of the best parts for me. Uh, we're getting ready to do our annual plan. Um, it's not necessarily a strategic plan, but if we were able to answer these questions, um, it, we're definitely going to be on track to have a really good plan for, for the next one to three years. So what is the assessment of the external environment? Is our business or industry going away? Are we being affected deeply? Um, this came into play when I had collision centers because the uh, rates that we were able to charge insurance companies to do repairs was not moving anywhere near the clip of the cost of labor. And so we knew that the industry was going to be on the rocks. So we decided to get out of the industry because the more we looked at the um, opportunities and threats in that business, uh, it didn't, it, the strengths of our company and the opportunities in the industry were not going to outweigh the risks. So the, what is the assessment right now for equipment rental, for event rental and tent rental? You know, is that something you're going to stay in? Um, how well do you understand existing customers and markets? Um, so now we're getting into the specifics of our marketplace. And uh, I noticed that, you know, Charlie, when we do confidential information memorandums for people who are exiting the industry, it's really the first time that we look at their immediate competition and gather information about them. Um, it yeah. may it may be useful to do that before we're looking to before, sell the business, yeah. right? And <laughs> right? say, uh, if you're going to do your annual plan, mm -hmm. let's talk about your three K main competitors and what you think, how that may affect you, right? Especially mm -hmm. when your closest competitor sells to Sunbelt or United, right? Is United just going to park equipment there? Or are they going to uh, not really focus on growing that particular site? They just want coverage. Mm -hmm. So all those things factor into it. Um, next question, what is the best way to grow the business profitably and what are the obstacles to growth? So that is a big one, uh, especially when we look at event rental and looking at, you know, our customer markets um, and who we're focusing on. And if there's any difference in rates and discounting, 
Um, I've seen people grow rapidly, but give up quite a bit of profitability. And as growth slows and you're still not making the margins that your peers are making, that could be a problem, right? So yeah. you need to know uh, when to make a shift. Who is the competition? Can the business execute the strategy? That's looking at your capability, which uh, plays into the third part, which is operations, the third process. Um, and then what are important milestones for executing the plan? Those are critical. Um, if we establish goals for the year, we need to establish milestones. It doesn't have to happen at the exact same time, but you need to know, are we progressing on the goal? So what does that look like at the 90 day mark or the 180 mark? Um, that are, are the short term and the long term um, elements balanced? Um, what are the critical issues facing the business? And how will the business make money on a sustainable basis? So those are some key points for your questions for your strategic plan. So first off, the importance of hows. Um, this is important. Um, we have a tendency to focus on vision, 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 and then we let the execution evolve over the course of the year, right? Oh, we're trying to accomplish the goals we set. There's nothing worse than um, establishing a goal of 10% growth and not really having a plan to get there, just hoping that the wind blows the right direction, right? So that's a problem. Um, so are the building blocks solid? And um, the building blocks are, it's the key concepts that you're talking about, but also the actions that define them. So it's kind of like the action planning on any of the key concepts. Um, and I looked at it as goals. So I wrote that in, we sometimes call them goals. Um, the goals have to have milestones attached to them. Um, so the building the strategic plan, who's going to build it? It's those who execute it. I initially, you know, was on the impression like, oh, president, CEO, visionary, they're the ones that's gonna that are gonna build a strategic plan. Well, no, the people are gonna say whether that can be accomplished or not. And so those are the people who execute, and they're the ones ultimately that have to build the plan. Well, but the visionary is still showing the people where to go, right? Sure. Like where they want to be three to five years from now. They're setting those targets. But also, um, it's it could be reflective in questions saying, how you know, okay, great, you want us to grow, you know, and everybody has that um, thing. We're going to grow twenty five and twenty four or whatever. They have like a little sure. catchphrase, and it, and it doesn't necessarily make sense to the people in operations because it's like, where did that come from? Why why do people pick what they pick in terms of growth? What's what's driving that uh, expectation? Um, so what is the assessment of the external environment? How well do we understand the existing customers? So forth, so on. So these are the, the questions, again, that we covered in the previous one. Uh, the most important, I think, are looking at these milestones and issues um, and what the impact they might have for a strategic plan. Um, also, you can be looking at a strategic review, strategy review. Um, so in this case, you want to ask these types of questions. How well versed is each business unit team about the competition? So that would be like if you look at, uh, you know, a, a business, you'd have your marketing, sales and marketing focus versus peers or your com competition, you might look at your production and operation side versus uh, um, competition. Um, how strong is the organizational capability to execute the strategy? That really has to do with, um, uh, again, assessing your current team and making sure that you can get from, you know, point um, one year, three year, five year. Do you have the right bodies uh, the right people on the team in the right positions to get you to that next step. Um, and some of that has to do also with the behavior tendency of the person. So if they are uh, someone who's waiting to be directed, then that might not be as good uh, as someone who might, you know, work with a CEO to help establish goals with them. Um, 
is the plan scattered or sharply focused? That's a good one. It looks at uh, really your product suite as well as your customer market segments. So that would be an indication of, did we say we're growing 10% or did we say we're growing uh, 10% in this particular area, 5% in this area and 15% in that area? You know, like how detailed did we get with it? Mm -hmm. um, are we choosing the right ideas? So again, it's a, just a question to reflect on. Are the linkages with people and operations clear? So that's a good one. That goes back to the people strategy and the ops strategy or the ops piece, ops process, and knowing that everybody sees that link between the three of them. And then last is following through. And, and again, you can look backwards to say, how do we follow through in the past? What's that look like going in the future? All right. Last section on the three um, really is the operations process. And this is the end of the book. Starts to get a little tired. Makes you want to pick up another book to focus on operations. Um, how to build a budget in three days is a section of the book that's I thought was good. Um, you know, part of what it is is, and we've... <laughs> We had this happen recently with us putting these budgets together with our members was, OK, we're going to grow 10 percent. What is going to change? What's going to change in the business in terms of staffing or whatever's required to be able to say that we can fulfill that and have that growth happen? So that's that's an important piece. Um, the importance of synchronization between those three sections, making sure that, you know, all of them are done well at the same level. Um, and sound assumptions, the key to setting realistic goals. So that uh, when it comes to um, establishing a plan for a one year, three year, five year strategic plan, uh, you make assumptions and they're cursory assumptions when you're doing the financial planning, but then they have to become like legit, like, oh yeah, that's a real deal. And you can actually <laughs> really sit do in this. What's that? We really got to do this. It it sucks, but it's good because mm -hmm. it it's it's like, you know, a lot of people want to just say it and move on, but ultimately got to live in it and say, well, how are we going to do this? Like when we were growing 30, 40 percent a year, um, we didn't have to add staff to support that growth because we were so small. But now that we're growing 18 percent a year, um, we're big enough that every time we say we're going to grow another 18%, we need more bodies. We can't grow 18% with the same staff. So I think that's what's happening with a lot of the larger companies. Uh, we have some members that have over 500 employees, and they are literally adding employees every week, which means they're looking at candidates like probably five candidates a week to get one week, one a week hired. Um, <laughs> It's just insane, right? So you need to be able to to have the back end fulfillment on any planning that you're going to be doing. It's a big it's a big deal as you get bigger, right? So if you have seven employees, it's not a, as big a deal. You're going to add one person and you got 25 percent growth, right? Something like that. But but when you get larger, now it becomes a whole nother element. Um, Charlie, do you have any peer groups where they talk about talent acquisition as a key role in the company or? Not, I don't, I don't think anybody in my groups is big enough that they've got a dedicated person doing it. You know, they so talk think, about it and where they're looking for people and that kind of thing, but not a dedicated person for the most part. So I know both Terry Hagee and I talked about that because I have the premier group and he's got the platinum yeah. group. And so it's like insane to think about these operators that are, you know, focused on renting equipment, but spend more energy and time and money on recruiting and hiring. Mm -hmm. Like it's just crazy. Yeah. Um, so building the operating plan behind the annual plan or the strategy plan is crazy. Like the fact that we, I've never talked about this ever in a peer group setting because it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. do the uh, do some rocks, you know, have quarterly <laughs> rocks. 
get the operating plan. And, you know, and some people grow 17% mm -hmm. and somehow they manage to get an operating plan going, but I'm pretty sure they're not putting in, like, it's going to get harder and harder as they get bigger. There's no question. Yeah. Um, so there's an art to making trade-offs, which I hate any owner, uh, visionary uh, hates trade-offs. It means you're compromising your vision. So you need to like, that section's pretty decent because it's kind of like, like, oh, okay, so that's reality. Reality is, is that uh, you're going to have to make trade-offs every time mm -hmm. somebody has to say something that you don't want to hear, right? Um, outcomes of the operation process, I think was great. That's really focuses on the end result and then working backwards. Here's our end result. What needs to happen to make that happen? Um, after the meeting, follow through and contingencies. So you do strategic planning meeting, um, understanding that there would be contingency plans, right? Um, and that was a section of the book in this particular side of it was, what's our contingency plan? Let's have a contingency plan. So with people who are doing their pro formers and their budgets this next couple of months, we really asked for them. And you'll see this in my budget video that just went out to the um, association people is you're going to have that's your most likely, but you're going to have a best case and a worst case. So those are contingency plans. Think about what that might look like and what your business might look like supporting that. Right. Especially if it's cutting, it's got to cut 25 percent. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think I may have shared before but we had a peer group member who projected 10 percent growth i want to say maybe it was six percent growth projected six percent growth created the plan uh worked eos had the quarterly call or the quarterly pulse meetings and ended up at a 10 percent loss on, or 10 percent down on sales for the year so didn't achieve the six percent growth didn't um, didn't even break even ended up at 10 percent growth less so the net effect was insane like that's a pretty huge difference big swing and if payroll didn't change mm -hmm. you know that you know the person who pays the bill is going to be the owner right so mm -hmm. i think that was a wake-up call to say hey we have to take these the budget process seriously we have to uh, be have contingency plans and we have to make adjustments right and that's what that last piece is the quarterly reviews, knowing that, um, you know, we uh, are looking at it quarterly. I personally probably will not adjust my budget pro forma strategic plan uh, till I hit the midpoint of the year. But uh, again, they're saying at least keep your eye on the ball, right? So, and the book ends with goals to live by, um, and. It ends with a letter to a new leader from the two authors. And there it was really cool. I don't remember any takeaways on that. They may <laughs> read the book. Give <laughs> me to Google ripped, it real quick. <laughs> I just ripped out the last three pages of the book on everybody who's just watching this video right now. So <laughs> there you go. If Demita was here, she would know. She would know. She, we'll blame her. So, uh, yeah, it was all about, so I'm just reminding myself now I'm looking at it. It really was about, um, uh, it, it just reiterated the people side, making sure that you have skills on st and staff on in place to be able to achieve your strategic goal, right? The people element linked to strategy. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. the second one is operations, which is asking the how. So it has that on there. And then they make a point that you can't do it alone. You need to uh, really focus on your staff implementing the strategic plan and not make it just be the visionaries yeah. uh, thing. So that's it. Boom. Another book completed. Last book of the year. Good job. Yeah. yeah. Good job. Awesome. OK, well, thanks for coming out. And uh, We'll see in the new year. We actually are going to be joined by an author. Um, we're going to our book is going to be organizational muscle. And uh, the author is Kevin Nolan. And you heard it here first. He's going to be uh, joining us for that book club. He doesn't know it. Nice. Yet, though, but he will, he will <laughs> be joining us. We might actually like right. to read that one then.
Yeah, it's good. I sent it out to 35 uh, or 30. It was our customer council and chair people. So we got nice. like good deal. a bunch of people got it. All right, gang. Sweet. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate Thanks. it. Yeah, right. Thank you. Yep. Take care.